Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting edition of Fun and Victorious podcast. I am your host, Andy, the Game Maker. And on today's program, we will actually I actually interviewed Joe Nearman, aka Good Logic, another uh, law tuber, as, as they like to call themselves. And today we're going to discuss how Joe be, came into to, to the legal practice, how he eventually tra transitioned over to a law tuber, on, how he got on YouTube. And then a lot of philosophical conversation or topics that we went back and forth on, which were really great and exciting. And I really hope you enjoy this, this conversation here today. But before we do that, a quick message from our main sponsor. Me. Crypto Cartel is a two to eight player game where players must work to build up their own resources in order to accumulate as much cryptocurrency while playing through the main deck three times. Players earn the ability to earn cryptocurrency as they collect cards of similar types and then exchanging them during the game. Simultaneously, the cryptocurrency gives each player the ability to earn cards from the Silk Road deck. These cards give players the ability to attack their opponents, defend any impending attacks, or fend off the DEA. The DEA cards appear in the main deck during the second and third rounds of the game, forcing a player to give up their most valuable production line. You must develop production lines with multiple cards in succession as quickly as possible. And in order to do this, you must make effective trades with other players. But be careful, get too far ahead and everyone will go after you. To purchase your copy of Crypto Cartel, the game that I made, please go to my website at www.andythegamemaker.com. And to go to my, my guests' social media links, just go to the description of this video. And I hope you enjoy the show. so much for stopping by on my uh, my program fun and victorious um this is a podcast that i use to just basically be able to share with people information on on you know small business uh, you know overcoming obstacles and just learning things about what what people do for a living and uh well, well, joe would you mind just uh taking a moment just to briefly introduce yourself sure my name is joe nearman i'm a new york litigator turned youtube content creator and right now I am uh, living the dream as far as the, 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 what I probably feel like I was always meant to do mm -hmm. in that I have a channel where I, I produce the occasional video, but I basically am engaging with thousands of people on a nightly basis. I do that five to six times a week. And for some reason, people seem to keep coming back. So <laughs> you must be doing something right. <laughs> something. I that's guess. great. That's I, that, I always, I always love that. I always, I always love hearing uh, people who from, you know, for lack of a better term, like they, they strike gold and they just, you know, just keep going and things just keep, you know, good things. I don't know. It just, I'm not sure where your take is on this. People like when, when you start to get on, on like a little rhythm here, you tend to find more and more success, the more you keep oh, doing it. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in confidence mm -hmm. and you know, the most confident person in the world, whoever he is, has some insecurities. We all have mm -hmm. our own personal mm -hmm. insecurities. And when we struggle to find success, so we, those insecurities start to flare up. Sure. And, and I think that, um, so that's why, and it, since confidence breeds success, it's that, that's part of why I think people get on a roll. I don't think it's just some karma in the air. Right. Although I do think I am a big believer. I'm, I'm a religious person, a big believer mm -hmm. in God. And I think God yes. plays into it, but you know, just on, on a humanistic type of perspective, I mm -hmm. think that our confidence just breeds for the success and you gain more confidence as you, as you succeed. So yeah. it becomes a, a nice little snow, a healthy snowball, as opposed to sometimes most, most people in life, I think tend to suffer more from the opposite snowball mm -hmm. that it's like things start going wrong and they start, you know, feeling like they're drowning and becoming pessimistic 
and and losing their confidence and it tends unfortunately to snowball in the opposite direction right so okay it's nice to be on this side of the mountain yeah for sure yeah it, it, it reminds me of one of my favorite all-time quotes is i think it was uh um john s mills i, th- I think it, uh, if i remember correctly uh mills being the last name um but anyways uh the, the quote is luck is a residue of good design so you mm-hmm. know you, you oftentimes hear people say oh right place right time well yeah but th- there's there's a reason why you know yeah. right 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 place right time you knew your your instincts were kind of putting you um down that path to, to be wherever it was you were when you you when you, when you became really fortunate really successful kind of like uh what happened with the Rittenhouse child but um with, with a lot of the law tubers I know it, it, you know my sister was you know that that helped boost your profile quite a bit I'm sure it helped you too as well yeah although I gotta tell you, I don't think luck is a residue of design has anything at all to do with what I was just describing I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> well no I just I, <laughs> because but, that's luck is a res- think about it think about it, brother the yeah. luck is the residue of design is basically saying if you invest a lot of effort into planning things out you will tend to be more fortuitous as opposed right. to the confidence element that I was, which I think is okay. true. Okay. Okay. I yeah, think yeah, it's yeah. true. But yeah. I was really focusing more on when someone feels confident about something that things t- tend to work. <laughs> I'm just, I'm no, just no, saying, no, you're good. You're, no, those no, you're are good. two you're different good. elements. Those are two completely different elements. No, that's I'm very fair. into dissecting things. Into no, no, like, no. Yeah, I am too. I am too. That's, I, I, I really like writing. No, that's a, that's a good call it though. I would agree with that. It's, it's, you're talking about more about confidence. I, I think, um, that, that's just, I guess that's just what it reminded me of when, when you were saying that, just, just right. by, by doing this, but being on a roll, so to speak, right? Yeah. Um, right? Okay, cool. And so, so Joe, so you're you're a New York native, New York City. Are you like right in the city right now? So I'm not living. I'm not living in this. I grew up in Flushing, Queens, okay. and spent the first I don't know 30, 35 years of my life there. And then when it was time for me to buy a house. So I couldn't afford anything in my neighborhood. So I, I'm, I'm an Orthodox Jew mm-hmm. and Orthodox Jews by design, we're not ghetto wise historically because of the fact that, you know, the, the non-Jews herded us together. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, that happened obviously, you know, decades ago in Germany, but for the most part, historically for thousands of years, even when in diaspora, we've always heard it together. And part of that is if you're a practicing Jew, you actually, we pray three times a day and you're mm-hmm. supposed to pray in what's called a minion, which is a gathering of 10 of 10 men. And in, in other words, you can't live off on an Island by yourself and really be a fully observant Jew. So we tend to live, that's why you mm-hmm. have these Orthodox Jewish communities. Mm-hmm. Besides that, there are other ritualistic type of things, which um, you need to have, you need to have certain th- things set up in mm-hmm. order for a community to, to actually operate. You need to get kosher food. You can't get kosher meat. And right. if you go out to, you know, middle Iowa <clears throat> to some small town, mm-hmm. they just don't have it. They don't have it there. So that's why we end up always congregating together, which means that if I'm looking for a place to live, so I need to find a Jewish community. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to just start building my own Jewish community. Yeah. So, so I'm sort of choosing from like a bunch of different hot spots, which are potential avenues and all the Jewish areas in New York city, the, the, the prices were just ridiculous. Like a yeah. fully attached house was mm-hmm. like half a million, half a million dollars. And, you know, so I moved out here where it's like, you know, I have a nice little plot of, plot of land over here in, in Jersey, 10 miles from, from mm. midtown Manhattan. Okay. And yeah, I paid under 400 for it. So that was like something that I could at least, <laughs> you know, afford. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, but I say, you know, I'm only admitted in New York city. So I was, I kept practicing in New York city. And when lockdowns came, I, I, my practice really dried up and I started engaging in social media, which is something mm-hmm. I had always done um, anonymously. Like mm-hmm. I would, I would basically, I had different names because I was like, I don't need people finding me or getting exactly. mad at me. So I right. just always, and also I'm so old, like that. I remember when the internet started, nobody used their real name online. Mm-hmm. This is a new phenomenon that started with Facebook or, or maybe MySpace, but when we first came on for security purposes, we were always told, no, use some handle, make, create some name for yourself. Don't use your real name. It was only mm-hmm. when social media became popular mm-hmm. and everyone's posting pictures of themselves and their kids and whatever. That's when people started using the real name. So, so for basically the first 15, 20 years of the internet, I was always operating under a pseudonym. And then when lockdowns came, I was like, you know what, let me try branching out into like, you know, stepping out as myself and engage with people. Cause I will always in- enjoy a nice healthy dialogue with mm-hmm. someone who I disagree with Good. who's able to who I can sort of like 
share with them logically, not trying to win a fight for the purpose of winning a fight, but just here, let me engage your brain and tell you why I'm looking at this from a different perspective. And you tell me why you're looking at it from that perspective. And hopefully somewhere along the way, we'll find truth. Right. So, so that's basically, so I was like, you know what, let me try doing this as myself. And um, I happened to, I happened to live in the same community as Ron Coleman. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked when I came onto social media and I saw this guy, he, if you, he prays in the same synagogue I did. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for, for a decade Mm -hmm. and I'm like, he sat behind me and I would barely say, you know, good morning to him when I would see him in shul. And he looks, and he looks when you see him on the street, as just like another typical Jew, nice guy, nothing, you know, another lawyer, which my shul has plenty of lawyers. Right. So I never had anything to do with him. And all, and all of a sudden I look and he's got like 150,000 <laughs> subscribers on Twitter. And I'm like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> who is like, uh, that was like the weirdest thing in the world. And yeah, it turns out like he's, you know, some national celebrity yeah. of sorts. Right. In that, you know, he's arguing before the Supreme Court. And mm-hmm. he had told me, he, he had talked to me about that once. Mm. And he successfully argued in front of the Supreme Court. He won his case before the Supreme Court. Wow. And yeah, the, he was. He had the slants case. The slants were basically a. I think they were like a rock group, mm-hmm. and their name. The question was whether their name was racist and could not mm-hmm. be trademarked, and therefore could not be trademarked. And he ended up defending them and getting it and getting the trademark, I believe. So, yeah. So anyway, so he so he had a bit of a following, and he started promoting people to follow me, and then I started just talking on YouTube, and he would share that, and. Um, this Minnesota lawyer saw one of my rants because I would basically rant about different things. Like a year ago, I was ranting about certain things that, you know, about certain elections and (laughs) certain court, certain certain court decisions. I wonder which ones, Joe. (laughs) (laughs) Certain court decisions involving Pennsylvania and Texas. And this Minnesota lawyer is like, hey, you want to come on my show? And I was like, sure, what time are you on? He's like, midnight, we start. And I go for like three hours. And I was like, okay why not and yeah and at the time actually so that was nick ricada at the time mm-hmm. he had like he had ninety thousand subs by the time i came on his show he was like close to like 150 he, he had jumped up like considerably during the time from when we scheduled to when i ended up appearing and and we hit it off really well we, we were just like a, and yeah and i ended up coming on a show a few more times and I consider him like a, I consider him like a real friend. I met him once actually. Oh, cool! And yeah, we were both down in Florida at the same time last spring, and I, and I met him, and I actually took him out for a night of drinking, and he I got him nice and plastered right before he went on air, and <laughs> he was and and we have a genuine like I have a genuine connection. We're like you know what I we have a, we have a deep mutual respect for each other and enjoy and enjoy like just chilling and hanging out. That's so. Good. That's so really when he's good. yeah, but I think Alita, I think Alita was was really part of the start of that phenomenon of law to your sister mm-hmm. and and legal mindset because when they were doing the written house trial, right? So that that there was one moment that they had there when Gage Grosskreutz was on cross examination. Oh my which, goodness! Yeah, which just went viral and was seen by like five million people. Yeah, and that... yeah, people just started flooding to their channel after that. They just started flooding. He went from having like 10, 15,000 people watching him. In an instant, I mean, 25, 30, and every day it would grow by five, 10,000. So that by the time it got to the verdict, it was, you know, 130,000 people. And while legacy media was having like 7,000, PBS right. was having, the PBS was the biggest one. They had 50,000. I think he probably had more people watching him than all of legacy media combined online. Right, right. I saw that. Yeah, I saw, I saw those numbers. It was really impressive. I think it was around like 120, 130,000. Mm-hmm. At one point, which is like, and I think the next one was like, I want to say, I'm trying to be as charitable as possible, like 50,000, I think was the next best one. Yeah. Um, and then it, it was staggering after that. But like, it was, um, it's really remarkable just, 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 t- you know, looking back and reflecting on this. Um, are you by chance, have you ever heard of the term information feudalism before? No. Okay. So the very first time I heard um, information feudalism was from uh, Dr. James Lindsay. Are you familiar with James Lindsay by chance? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there was he, on one of his episodes, on his podcast episodes on uh, his, his new discourses platform, he talked about um, information feudalism. And, and it was on his episode about the, the, the second 
enlightenment, which I thought was really interesting. It was very much a white pill episode. And what was really interesting about it is he, did, he used that to describe the way mass, you know, quote unquote, mainstream media, which I don't think it's, it's mainstream anymore. That's why I don't refer to it as such. Um, it's, I just refer to it as a corporate press, but basically um, what, he, what he basically described is that the fact that it was all centralized, it's all, it's all one, in one place. That's why it's kind of part, why some people refer to it as the establishment. And so what I thought was really astounding, you know, putting that in the context of what you, you know, my sister, as well as Riketa, all those, all those other law tubers um, together, what you all were doing is you were disrupting uh, said information feudalism, which I thought was really, which is really great because never, I, I, I can't think of a time. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 37 years old, um, but I can't think of a time in my lifetime, not that I'm that old, um, but I can't think of any moment where, where they, we had a moment that was very similar to what we saw with the Rittenhouse trial, for example, for okay. you had, you had a stream, you had a whole bunch of lawyers such as yourself providing commentary in real time as it was happening, which yeah. I thought was very, very uh, beneficial to the public at large. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I, that was just really useful. And it's just like, um, at one point, let me, let me ask you this, at what point are you, uh, do you do you see yourself as as like becoming almost like a journalist? I mean, like it's I, I it's it's so close to like doing like I mean, especially Jur when, that not to get into with the, the Maxwell stuff, for example. That I would consider that actual like journalism. What, what you were that, doing that was journalism, yeah. and I didn't I didn't realize it. I didn't realize right. it until right. until I actually I didn't realize that's what I was doing until I actually started recording stuff, and I was like, I'm standing here like another freaking journalist. Right. This is like, this is like, there's a whole bunch of journalists standing there and they're doing their recordings and I'm doing my recording. I was like, holy hell, I became a journalist. This is pretty wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It just completely changing um, the, the way we consume, you know, mass media, so to speak, the way we consume information nowadays. And I, I, that's one of the thing I, I, things I, I, I was like truly appreciative of what you all were doing because mm -hmm. it was another source of information, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I, want, I want to try to make sure I'm being as, as you know, uh, measured with my words as I say this, but none of it was really watered down. I mean, I don't think any of you were really holding back with anything what you were saying and not trying to. I know what, one of the things that, that Kurt, you know, Uncivil Law does, he accuses legal evil, legal eagle of hiding the ball. I mean, like, I'm not sure what your thoughts were. Like, how do you look back on that with respect to, like, the, like what, I was, what I've been, been saying about information feudalism? So, with respect to, to that experience, it was a really interesting thing. Being, being a part of that, because we it was obvious that we were part of some sort of like small cultural phenomenon. Right. And, you know, even right now, looking back on it, it's still too soon to know what type of genuine impact that's going to have, whether that mm -hmm. was a one off or whether that's something that will continue to snowball. And right. obviously, we all hoping that, that it continues to snowball, not just we part of law too, but I think that all the people who are watching us, they were calling and basically saying we want more of this type of content. Right. I, I don't know that. The Rittenhouse trial was somewhat unique in that it was a case that all of America was really, it was very polarizing for America. Mm -hmm. You either, you were more so than, let's say, the, uh, the last big trial before that, which was the Chauvin trial. Mm -hmm. So the Chauvin mm -hmm. trial was polarizing, but not quite as polarizing, because it's not as if there was people, conservatives who were standing up for Derek Chauvin. It, there wasn't there wasn't that type of thing of like wow he better win because this is an injustice if he loses right right Back nobody to yeah right no nobody felt that way because a lot of people looked at like you know what he really might kill that guy in which case he should go to jail that's how conservatives think it's not like mm -hmm. it's my guy he's not my guy because he's a cop he's either he's either guilty or he's innocent that's what right. we're looking at it and so it, that was not nearly as polarizing even though it was something that garnered such wide national attention but the uh, the Rittenhouse trial. We all heard this narrative, which was being shoved by what you call corporate media. I, I call them legacy media, mm -hmm. and only because they're names that are known for you know decades, mm -hmm. generations. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, but I think corporate media is equally fair, and yeah, it, it, everyone saw the narrative that's being promoted there, which you know, and the defamation of who Kyle Rittenhouse was, as if that would be a basis to convict him, even if he was all the horrible things that he was saying. And we were just, and we were just astonished because we see the video, the vi if not for the video, the whole Rittenhouse trial is a whole different story. 
No one would yep. understand how innocent he was without all that video. The video was was so um, the term we use in Latin in amongst lawyers is res ipsa loquitur, which mm -hmm. is Latin for the thing speaks for itself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, you don't have to prove that a calendar is from the year 20 is from the year 2017 if it's got 2017 written all over it so that's concept right. of it speaks for itself i don't need to attest to the fact that it's from 2017 i'm not sure if that actually would apply but you understand right. what i'm saying sometimes exactly. you look at something and it just and it just it just says more than any words could possibly say about it right. and those videos were so clear how this is a kid running for his life from a mob or from some crazy lunatic charging at him and mm -hmm. trying to just defend mm -hmm. himself and yet we're hearing all this talk about how he's this evil kid who went there trying to, you know, trying to, to kill people. And in this, this narrative, and it became so polarizing that that, that, could, be, that could be something that would, sh would not be repeated on a, on a frequent basis. That you have sure. a case that's so po polarizing. Even if you have such a big case, like the Maxwell trial that I was covering. Mm -hmm. So that was one which was, was not polarizing. The entire world wanted to see this woman put away forever. So it's not like there was like two sides of it where you all, you feel like that rooting interest in the Rittenhouse right. trial. It's like, we felt like when we heard him, the, all those not guilties, you know, I, I started tearing up a lot of people, you know, just erupted in euphoria. Whereas on the other side, there was, you know, genuine anguish mm -hmm. that, that you don't have that where it's like, you know, my team versus your team in most yeah, trials. Right. So whether or not that will repeat on a regular basis, I don't know. But what I do know is that Trump changed the way the public at large look at the media. Mm -hmm. He really popularized the term fake news. I don't know if he coined it or if he just popularized it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't really matter. Without him, there would be no common concept of fake news and people being awakened to the fact that, hey, this is crap. We're watching a lot of crap here. It's stupid. Yes. And mm -hmm. they're just, they, they're starting from a certain agenda and they're going to frame everything to fit that narrative where it's like, you know, the, the same way Ilan Omer so, said, you know, some planes did that thing, did the thing flying into the airplanes. We have now, you know, because it's a black driver, it's like this car drove through a parade right. or the let's go Brandon effect. All of this is basically reflective of the same. Let's, let's try and like, you know, convince the, the, our viewers to believe what I tell you, not what you see. Right. And it's, and it's, and we're, and Americans are getting sick of it. So, and, and I think it's even starting to, to, to become something that on the left, it's starting to smack them in the face. We're like, this is just, we're not, this is just ridiculous. This is just propaganda. It's not news. Right. So, so I think that this, it could be that this, this search for genuine, unfiltered harsh truth yep is something that becomes the way of the future i will tell you but something that was interesting that when you say you know you don't think anything was watered down i don't think we could water it down because right. if i'm in a law tube you have to picture you think of put yourself in our shoes put in your sister's shoes my shoes in all the members of law tube shoes so we all want to contribute mm -hmm. right i'm sitting right. here with 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 seven eight other really smart people they're all attorneys. They all understand what they're watching. They all, you know, have, you know, they're all going to take us. We'll, we'll, we'll all see, let's say, 90% the same thing at the same mm -hmm. time. But 10 to 10, 10 to 15% of it, we might have our own little unique perspective on it, our own, our own insight. So in order for me to display my value to the audience, which is part of what the whole agenda is here. Look, I'm, when I'm going, I'm spending hours a day, day after day, I'm spending my entire day day sitting in front of a camera yeah part of my agenda here is i'm trying to help promote my channel get my name out there get my face out there exactly well, if i'm just going to sit there mutely the entire time well why the heck is anyone interested in me compared to the other seven eight people they're just sort of like you know, i sort of blend into the background there mm -hmm. so part of what you want to do when you're sitting there is you want to be respectful you don't want to over talk anyone on the trial you don't want to over talk anyone else mm -hmm. while they're talking mm -hmm. so you're sort of looking for your spot to share your unique perspective. Well, right. your unique perspective is not going to be watered down. It's going to be something that's completely unique and, 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 you know, from your own eyes. And hence, it almost forced each of us to up our game to bring something that much more. That's not, I'm not in, I'm not in competition right. at, you know, with any of them. If we all rise, that's great. But 
at the same time, I don't want to blend completely into the background. Mm-hmm. So I so I sort of I, I sort of am forced to sort of think about things from a different perspective. I want to share truth. I want to share, you know, my perspective. But yeah, nothing's going to be watered down. Mm-hmm. And, and at the end of the day, we're all looking to just, you know, we're not looking to sit here saying this person wins because I like their politics. This person wins because they look more like me. It's a matter of we all just want the truth out there. We're sick of lies and we just want the truth out there. So sure. between those elements that there's no rooting interest and that we're trying to show our unique skills. So you're going to get eight intelligent people who are sitting there basically you're giving you very sharp insight and interacting. And then when you hear someone else say something you're like, hi, I never thought about that. And you just sort of poke each other with different questions, not, not in a, not in a, in a pro- provocatory way, but more of a matter of like, well, what would you say about this? And how did you think about that? And, right. and, and it just sort of helps us each just grow as, a, as journalists, lawyers, whatever it is that we're, we're doing, however you want to coin what we're doing here. Mm-hmm. I've been rambling for a while, but. <laughs> you're good you're good no this is all really great really engaging it's it's um you know i, I have a lot of questions i want to ask you right now but but before i do, do it, it i want to i want to ask you first of all so so how did you ultimately get into law like what's your what's your law story your, your law background like how, like how did you because obviously you know there's there's a lot to back there's a lot to transition that i want to you know get get more in a deep diving but then what's what's the lawyer side of, of joe nearman like how, how did you you know, ultimately decide you know what i want to be a lawyer I was five years old when I decided I want to be a lawyer. Oh, wow. That, yeah. That, oh, cool. Yeah. I was like, this is like, I, would, I always felt like I was born to argue uh, <laughs> from the time I was five years, literally from the time I was five years old. Right. So, and I've always been deeply analytical and it's mm-hmm. almost, it's law is frustrating in that you don't really get to do that on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. What I do now engaging with people and being analytical, well, you know, probe them you don't do that professionally when you're a lawyer, you might have some moments where you're trying to analyze something, right. but you know, th- that doesn't happen on a daily basis. And so it doesn't really feed that, that animal inside of me, which is starved for, for that type of thing, as far as breaking things down. I've always been the type of person. I like studying people and just thinking to myself, why is it that people think a certain way. Why do I react to it? I assume that who I am as a person is generally how most people are. I don't assume that I'm different from most people, even though I probably am different from, mm-hmm. from many people. From, but at the same time, I assume that my overriding motivations and attitudes about things are sort of a baseline of where people start. And I will literally fixate on things and just break it down in my mind. For example, I'll tell you one thing I'm trying to break down right now. Okay, I'll give this to you. I'll, I'll, I'll let, and it's the sort of thing I enjoy <laughs> engaging with my audience. Okay, right, let's have it. So I, I, I just got a new MP3 player. Okay, and I'm loading up because okay. when I work, when I work out, I want to get back to the gym. So when I work out, I need like songs that are going to have a good beat to them. And what I found is that there are a number of songs which will have um, a chorus type of, of part mm-hmm. where it sounds like there's like an audience of like hundreds of people just going like, oh, Mm -hmm. and there's there's dozens of songs like that. And then Mm -hmm. like a little beat, like a bump, bump. For example, like the, I was, that was just like the greatest showman song, right? Right. Where it's like, you just sort of feel that and you just start pumping. And there's like literally, um, there are literally dozens, if not hundreds of songs like that. And every one of them, is something that like, I don't, I've never met anyone who hears a song that they're like, oh, I hate that song. No, everyone likes that. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to think like, why is that something that just works so intuitively with us? For example, like um, Doctor Who on holiday, like da 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 da, hey, everyone feels that sort of, you can't not feel it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of, uh, so I'm sort of like wondering to myself, what about that? that whole thing of having a whole chorus of people with a drum beat it becomes so alluring to the masses and i was thinking like maybe this is something that's intuitively tribal within us like it sort of touches a tribal nerve with us so that's what i so and that's the sort of thing like i will sit there and i'll think about that for like a couple of days just trying to figure out like what about it is it you know and what elements to it are necessary in order for that thing to actually work as effectively as it does and that sort of thing just sort of fascinates me. And then when I come to conclusions on it, I always like want to find one or two people, which I'll be like, 
all right, this is what I got. Was I what I got? What are your thoughts on? Do you think that makes sense or not? To sort of like test my theory on, um, you know, the outside, you know, outside right. my own brain. Right. So yeah, and people kind of people tend to react well to that. They sort of like you sort of to get them to start thinking, and everyone likes having that part of their brain engaged. I think for most a lot of people do. Right. Right. No, that, that's 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 really interesting. So it's like um. It, well, I, I think part of the reason why, I, th- I don't know, it's, um, it just reminds me of, like what they say in, in, in Hollywood, at least, um, not that I, I've spent like a whole lot of time in Hollywood necessarily, but like, uh, one of the things I've learned, cause it's me, um, I'm not, I'm not sure if you remember this about me, but I, 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 you know, I got to the army. I wanted to pursue a creative background, um, okay. which is what I wanted to do. I wanted to get into filmmaking, this and that. And so I did, did a lot of reading, did a lot of research. And oftentimes that's why you see them recycle a lot of like, you know, existing IP, a lot of existing content, because mm-hmm. kind of like to your point, like it's it, it, intuitively, they, they know it works. Yeah. And, and they just, it, it makes them feel a very specific way that it's like, kind of like why um, oftentimes you'll see these movies that have a lot of nostalgia baked in them nowadays. It's because right. people, people like it. They like falling back on that. And so like, let, but yeah. you're, you're exactly right in what you just said. That was, right. that, that, and that's that's the perfect that's the perfect allegory to mm-hmm. to what I'm describing here. But if you can understand mm-hmm. the psychology behind it, what right. is motivate? Then you don't need to see the box office numbers. Mm-hmm. You can actually be creative and be ahead of the curve because you're like, you know what? This is what will work. This mm-hmm. is why. This is how I can tweak it in a way that hasn't been done before. Mm-hmm. which will be unique, which I know is going to resonate with the masses because it's got these certain basic components and yet it's completely different from what the world has seen before. That enables, that's why I like breaking this sort of things down because it sort of enables me to engage my creative side and think, okay, how, how could I take this in a slightly different way that, so that I'm adding to society? I'm bringing something new that no one has actually been able to savor before. And, and I think that, that if you can, that's why it's important to break down the psychology because then once you, once you understand that, if you really nail it, if you really get it right, well, in that case, you have so much, you know, power and ability to actually express yourself in ways that people are really going to respond to. And, and, and that's, that's being alive right there. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. And then um, I w- w- want to ask, so, so like, how did you, so I'm assuming you went to law school before you became a lawyer. Is that, is that, was yeah, that your, Fordham. yeah, Fordham law. Oh, okay. Fordham. Yeah. That's, that's a good school. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, I've actually been there once. Um, I was actually there cause, um, I went there for a history conference briefly. Um, I, there's, I, I, two I went, campus, there's two campuses of Fordham. The law school is in, in by Lincoln square in, in, on by Columbus circle. And the mm-hmm. other one's in the Bronx. Were you in the Bronx yeah. or you were in New York? I, th- I think, I, I, I think it was the Bronx. Uh, the, okay, yeah. yeah. So, so, um, I went there, uh, I went to, I went to school up the river. Um, I went to West point. So, um, right. yeah. So, um, that would have been, yeah, that's a different that's a different part of Fordham. Fordham is broken into two different yeah. areas completely. Right, so, right. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So so what Are was you your go- what was your Fordham experience like going to law school? So you have to realize I went to Yeshiva like my whole life. Mm-hmm. So I was always surrounded in class by like other Orthodox Jewish boys. It's mm-hmm. it's it's not it's never co ed. It's, mm-hmm. you know, when you go to an Orthodox, when you go to Yeshiva, it's they, we, we're split off. And in fact, they do everything they can to keep you away from the opposite gender because it's considered something's going to be distracting and lead you down just nothing productive. So uh, it wasn't until I got to college that I actually sat in a class with women. And even when I was in my undergrad school, when I was, which I went, I bounced around a few different CUNY schools, City University of New York has, mm-hmm. has several different branches. Right, right, right. So I, I pretty much was very isolated and alone from, I, I, cause I would just go there, I go to class and then I would leave and I'd be done. Right. And so this, so my law school experience was really the first time that I was engaging with the non-Jewish world, with your, with the rest of the world, um, on a, on a reg, on a day-to-day basis. Right. And it was, it was, I mean, it was, it was kind of a lot what I anticipated it would be like. It was a little bit, it's a little bit different when you're sort of thrown into a culture that mm-hmm. is somewhat foreign. Yeah. For example, like, you know, when I was growing up, none of us would ever go to a, hang out at a bar. That would just not be something that we would do. At, but when I was in law school, it's like, that's just like, no, that's what you do. You go, yeah, <laughs> right, right. You know, that's what, that's what you guys do a lot. So, and yeah, it was just, 
so that that was a little bit of an adjustment as it happened i met I met Lady Logic at near the end of my first year of law school, nice. and um, and I got engaged to her soon thereafter. So it's sort of um, and then I, and then and we do engagements and marriages in my community really fast. You'll get mm -hmm. engaged in a period of weeks, and you'll oh, get wow. married, and you get married three months later. Oh, it's wow. like you go within yeah within six months you can go from not meeting the girl to being married and her and she's pregnant. And that's mm -hmm. that's it. Really works like. Like that right. fast, right? So, um, yeah. What are your, so, what are your, what are your thoughts? I'm sorry, just like I find that very interesting. What, what are you, so like? How do you um? How do you explain that that short time window? Because obviously nowadays, especially today, where it's like I, you know, I, I know people who were like dating for ten years before they finally got married, and to me, mm -hmm. that's that is like on the opposite end, right? Right of, of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so, like, like how do you how do you explain that 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 you know that timetable you know for you and your wife, for example? like moving, moving quickly. Like, how do you look back on that? So that's, and that's what I always knew would, I would do. Okay. Whichever, whichever woman it was going to be, it was going to, that's, that's, how, that's how our, our culture and our society operates. So you mm -hmm. have to realize that Orthodox Jewish men and women don't, we're, we're prohibited from touching each other mm. unless it's your wife. Mm -hmm. So, and when I say not touching each other, I mean, physically mm -hmm. zero contact. I'm not just talking about coitus. I'm talking like literally zero contact. Not even a handshake. Right. Literally wow. not a handshake. Wow. So, so, and as a recognition though, of human nature that look, if you're, if you care about someone, you're around them for extended period of time, that becomes a test, which is becomes impossible. Mm -hmm. So especially if it's, you know, for a prolonged period of time. So, I mean, we don't, we don't deny the existence of, of, of natural human urges. In fact, we think that they're actually a blessing that God gave it to us. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that you don't need to control them or, or account for them in how you're going to conduct yourself. So when we, first of all, we don't date in general. Dating, boys and girls don't hang out together. Mm -hmm. um, not that they never do, but mm -hmm. I'm saying it's, it's frowned upon. Right. Um, and, and, then, and then when you start dating, it's like you're dating for the purposes of getting married. Right. And you will be set up. They actually, everything is set up by a blind date where you have a go between in between you and they like, look, this per, you know, this girl, they, they'll come to you and they'll tell you this girl seems like a great girl. We each have like a, today they'll have like a CV for each person who's oh, on, wow. the, <laughs> on the dating market. I'm not kidding. There's literally, and it wasn't like that when I was young, but now when you could just shoot a CV over to someone via text messaging or whatever, it makes sense to do that. We basically give a little background about the girl, her family, what school she went to, what she's looking for, what her education is, what type of, you know, professional aspirations he has, she has, et cetera. Right. And then, and, and there are different labels that we have for different, different types of Orthodox Jews. And those labels, um, are sometimes appropriate. Sometimes they're really a little bit too, um, too conforming. So anyway, the, the, the bottom line is, so, and then once each side agrees to go out, so they'll just keep dating until one of them says, no, this is not someone I want to marry. And then it's over. And you never see the girl ever again, you never have anything to do with her. And, and that's basically, and so when you, when a guy and a girl basically are set up like this, so they know already, generally where the person's coming from each one knows where the other one's coming from mm -hmm. and then they'll basically date and see okay do we get along do we you know we like each other we enjoy each other's company do we have mutual interest aspirations expectations etc and you know are we are we comfortable with each other are we attracted to each other etc and then once you once you basically click off everything after and you feel comfortable enough that you're like you know what this is someone who i, I can be comfortable with spending the rest right. of my life with and raising a family with well, let's do it. Let's get, let's get married. And then, and then the whole, the whole, and then the whole um, engagement period, it's like, they just rush as fast as possible to get everything set up and cook, you know, cooked out. And, you know, you, you, you get your haul and you send out your invitations and boom, voila, you're done. So, yeah. so yeah, so that, that, that's basically the, the process. So obviously we don't know each other as well. As right. a, a, you know, a couple that's been dating for 10 years. And that could be a good thing. That could be a bad thing. Part of learning about each other is, is part of the healthy part of relationship. I think, Yeah, I mean, the whole, the whole learning to exploring someone uh, is, is something that, you know, is part of the excitement of a new relationship at the same time. I'm not going to kid you the first year of marriage, when you're first, 
when you go from spending your entire life to literally, you know, just doing things whenever, wherever you want, whenever you want, and all exactly. of a sudden there's another person you have to answer to. Mm -hmm. You never had a relationship like that. Yep. See, you guys, when you've dated, every one of you has had a boyfriend, a girlfriend. I mean, mm -hmm. unless someone is, you know, like a real, you know, so sociopath, they've had some sort of relationship with, with someone of the opposite gender. So mm -hmm. you're sort of, you sort of like, you know, understand how relationships work mm -hmm. and they really, and there really isn't very much experience in that type of capacity for our youth. So they sort so it's sort of, there is an adjustment period. I'm not going to, I'm not going to kid you. Yeah. And, and yeah. And with me in my particular case, which is a common thing, because we believe in having large families. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, my, I seriously, I met my wife in April. She was pregnant with my child and we were married by the following September. Oh, wow. So yeah, right. that's basically within a span of five months, I wow. went from, from meeting this girl to being married to her and she's carrying my child. Wow. So, um, and that's my oldest who now has made me a grandpa twice. Grandpa Joe. Yeah. Grandpa Joe. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's it. Well, I, I want to ask you about that. So like, what's it like? Okay. Um, what's it like managing or trying to balance? Cause do you, do, do you still do the, the, um, do you still practice law? Right. Or are you pretty uh, focused on, on the, on the law tube stuff? And then how does that kind of, how does having a family kind of work in between all that? I have clients and I resent them. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I'm not taking new cases, yeah. but I have some old cases that are still kicking around. And every oh, time geez. I have to yeah. go back and open up a word document and just start typing up something or writing a letter to a judge or something like that. I'm like, this, this sucks. Agonizing, this is yeah. terrible. I mean, look, yeah. I'm not at a stage where Nick Ricada is at, like not where he basically, his hourly income, just when he streams for an hour. So the amount of money that he can, ex his expected revenue there, mm -hmm. God bless the guy. And I'm yep. saying this at, at, out, out of awe and admiration without the slight. And I hope, he, I hope that multiplies tenfold. All I wish yeah. is just nothing but blessing for that man. He has yep. to be a genuinely good person. Yes. What I'm saying is that realistically, he actually mentioned this on my stream. It, it makes zero sense for him to take a client at this point mm -hmm. because the amount of money he would have to charge per hour for it to be worth it to him is far beyond what is legal, what, he, what, what would be ethically proper for him to charge as an attorney, mm -hmm. right? So, because, I mean, if you think about it, if he's bringing in, and I'm not saying he's bringing in anything like this, but I'm saying is if someone is bringing $1,500 an hour, as a doing you doing a stream, which mm -hmm. is that's more than what he's bringing in. Okay, mm -hmm. but if someone's bringing that in, you so what am I, I'm going to charge you four hundred dollars an hour as an attorney? Why why would I want to be doing that? I'd rather mm -hmm. just be streaming. It's more it's it's easier. It's more fun. It's more my right. zone. Right. And I, so I, what are you going to pay me fifteen hundred dollars an hour? You can get a thousand other attorneys who would do it for a third that price. It's not fair for me to even charge you that. So right. he's sort of almost the the value that he's able to uh, achieve through YouTube has exceeded what his value is as an attorney yeah. and, and just as a practicing attorney. Even if he's the greatest attorney out there, there's so almost like no. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So he's almost in a place where it's like he has to be stupid to take on new clients. In fact, he said the only clients he takes on are pro bono cases where he, you know, he likes the person, he feels, he feels for them, he wants to help them, but he never charges money when he takes a new client on now. And that's why he's very reluctant to take cases on because look, pro bono work is work and it's, you know, it's time consuming. It's basically charity. Yeah. So, right. I mean, it's not, it's not even basically charity. Abraham Lincoln said that a lawyer's only asset is his time. So mm -hmm. if you're donating your time, you're donating your only asset. That is, that's genuine charity. Yeah. So, you know, everyone likes to do charity, but at the same time, you want to feed your family. You also don't want to be stressed beyond belief. Right. So, um, yeah. So I'm, look, I'm not, I'm not quite at that. I'm not at that point yet where right. it's like the amount of my, my hourly take ex is exceeding my hourly take on as, as an attorney. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm getting, I'm getting close to where they're almost even. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, oh, getting, wow. I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting close. I'm getting close to there. That's I mean, it's, a, it's like, it's probably like I make like two thirds of what I would charge hourly. And I figure that as my channel grows and things and things get be better, I'm, I want to get to that point. And I'd rather invest my efforts in far, as far as developing this, which I really enjoy. And I feel like I'm natural. I have natural 
uh, affinity for and natural ability for than investing it in trying to research, you know, whether or not this corporate veil should be pierced. Right. Like, it's just, <laughs> I, I, it just, yeah, that's interesting. So, so, um, but what was that, what was that transition like for you uh, to go to get into to YouTube? Like what was, um, what, what kind of, what kind of work did you have to do? Um, and, and, and I guess I'm asking just from the perspective of, of someone who's listening to this, they want to get some, some nuggets of knowledge from, from Joe Neerman from good logic to see, Hey, if I want to start a YouTube channel, uh, what should I seriously consider uh, before actually, you know, going on this journey? So what I was talking about before with the whole music thing, Mm -hmm. and finding something and being able to recreate it right i think that's a healthy approach in general for life yeah so i look i look at how ricada does what he does mm -hmm. and my goal is never to be nick i'm mm -hmm. not trying to be nick i want right. i want to be joe yes but exactly. there's certain el there's certain elements as to how he conducts himself which are are part of the formula as to how i'm going to motivate my audience to want to come back mm -hmm. to want to want to engage with me and make sure that i'm maintaining their interest rather than driving them away right. so you know there, there's a certain blend of of insight seriousness and humor mm -hmm. that you sort of want to that you sort of want to throw out there and also engagement with your audience and you know, and I think they like seeing people want to see truth and they want to see emotion. They don't want mm -hmm. to see a dead fish. And they also don't want to see they don't want to see that you're a hypocrite who's full of, you know, if you're going to take a position so you can say, uh, you know, uh, you can people have an issue with science today and everything that happened with with the medical community over the mm -hmm. last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And it's because they never own their mistakes. They basically they'll say things as if today, as if this is the no, this is the way it is, and we have it. You know, the implication is this is the way it's going to be going forward. If everyone does this and we get to this, everything's gonna be fine. And then it comes out later on, it's not true. And that disingenuousness is something that just grates at people and makes them resent you and not want to have anything to do with you. So part of what you really need to do is is in is you really want to if if you take a position that you really believe in believe in it if you say if you want to take a position and say, which is what you know Fauci for example could have done is he could have said look this is the best that we have as of right now and it makes sense to us given everything that we have but that's really subject to change based on a lot of different parameters that we can't really anticipate two right. three months from now right but this is what we're hopeful for and that's why we want to go in this direction mm -hmm. so that is a completely different message than saying this is right Right. And that's why there's nothing wrong with making a statement and qualifying it, saying, like, look, given all the information I have right now, this is what my position is on X. Mm -hmm. And here's why. But, you know, I'm not married to this position. And if it's position, position you're married to, then my take on it is emphatically back that position. You should have fleshed it out in your brain. If it's, if it's something you want to marry, I'm saying the right. opposite situation, you really believe in something. Well, in that case, you should have certainly fleshed that out in your brain as to all mm -hmm. the counter arguments to it. Yes. And, and be prepared for it and, you know, and be prepared for the counter arguments and, and, and don't be afraid to say it with conviction because people want, they want to hear the conviction in, and, and if you don't have conviction in it, then, then don't be screaming it. That's for sure. So <laughs> of course, right, right, right. Um, a lot, a lot of good. So I guess that the biggest takeaway is just be the best version of yourself. It kind of reminds me of when I was um, an army officer. One of the, one of the, um, one of the things that I, I learned was just like leading from your own personality. Don't try to be someone else because yeah. you, I can't, I can't be Joe Neerman. I can't be Nick Ricada. I can't be my sister. I'm going to be, you know, me, you Henry, know? Right. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, that's, and that's the, the thing is that's, you're going to be, you're, you know, if, if you're authentically you, I think is what it comes down to as well. Authentically you from a, a, that perspective. It, but you could be the, but you could be the best you. Yeah. By that, by that, I mean, this is what, this is what I mean. Yeah. I was always funny. Mm -hmm. I always had a good sense of humor. I was not always popular though. Right. People think that if you're funny, you're going to be popular. It's right. not true. Mm -hmm. It's the type of humor that you use. So I used to cut people down a lot. Right. And it I would amuse myself and I would make some other people laugh. And it was a type of, of displaying intellectual superiority. I was peacocking my intellectual superiority and making people feel like crap while at the same time doing it in a very funny way. Right. So 
So I would, I would always be proud of myself afterwards and people would laugh, but that didn't make me popular. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that a, I mean, I only realized this part many years later is that I was really displaying an insecurity, mm -hmm. right? You know, I constantly show people how smart I was. And, and the other thing is you're alienating the world because everyone thinks, oh my God, I'm going to be next and he's going to embarrass me. And you basically looked at it as like someone who's going to be punching down at, at people. And that's why one of, one of the lessons I turned when I, I, I took from that, and this is something that anyone can incorporate. Right. And it made me popular on law too. Mm -hmm. Whenever I would chill, I shilled other people. Mm -hmm. And then I would chill myself. But I right. always push, and I, would, and I would sort of mix it up. One time it would be legal mindset, another time it would be Kurt, another time it would be Alita. And I would just sort of be like, you know, and I would, and I would be genuine in the way I was shilling them, right. saying like, look, this is what this person brings. Mm -hmm. And this is why they deserve, you know, they deserve your subscription. And I would spend like a good 90 seconds promoting someone else. Right. And, and there's a certain, and that displays, first, aside from the fact that you're being nice and people like that. You know, when you're when you're when you're giving off, being publicly nice to others is something that is very endearing. And right. that's something anyone can do. And I think it actually benefits society, especially if you do it in a genuine way. Right. So so I was talking to Alita the other day. Mm -hmm. So I was on her channel and she was and I was like and she actually had made an analogy from something I had said. And she did it like twice. And I was like, wow, you're really good at finding like perfect analogies. That's a very impressive skill. That's, that's a good way of bringing it home in a way that people can understand it. And that's, that's a really great ability. Right. And if you're always, and so what I would recommend to anyone who's out there is look for the good in others. And when you can find that good in others, don't be shy about sharing it and expressing it. Right. It's a, it's a very powerful way to make you, A, it, it's, it's very endearing. People will like you. Not just the person who's hearing it, but people who are who are not just the person you're who who you're describing, but people hear it and they like you because they recognize that you're not petty, you're not insecure, you don't need right. to have yourself as be like the best at everything, and they respond positively to that. So right. the one thing the one thing that I would share with you, as far as being the best you, mm -hmm. is look for the good in others. Try and find, try and identify, like zero in on like particular characteristics that they have and 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 express it to them so that they can actually um so that so that they can actually um share in some of the attentions and, and appreciate and and actually feel validated you're making them feel good about themselves and you're only making yourself better for example you're sitting here right now listening to me basically dominate the entire time letting me go wherever <laughs> i want and that's a skill i don't have i can't that's the plan though by the way <laughs> There's a, yeah i'm saying ahead. is i interview other people i can't do it i can't do it that's <laughs> you have and i know that in your brain i know that you're sitting there quietly in your brain there must be like a, dozens of thoughts that are popping through your head every like every you know every minute and right. and yet you're sitting there just letting me do my thing in order to make me feel comfortable and, and, and let your, your viewers, you know, meet me. And that is a remarkable self. That's a, that's a display of remarkable self-control. Right. So I appreciate that. Yeah. It's, it's also cause, uh, you know, my day job, I'm in sales. So that's another reason why, <laughs> but, but, um, but at any rate, but, but there's a lot of really good, um, things that uh, you just, uh, you just kind of like triggered in my mind uh, that I wanted to just kind of like uh, share with you. And that's, um, um, well, number one, I, I think, having some type of charitable sent, you know, perspective in general, I think is really good. Even when it comes to pe with, with the people that you disagree with, because one of the things I've learned to really try to do is with people that, that I might have disagreements with, for example, is, um, are you familiar with like steel man arguments? Yeah. So to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's something that that expression is not something I was really familiar with until about this past year. And that is where I try to find their best argument possible. And I right. tried, and, and but because I'm doing two things. One, I'm I'm making sure that I'm I'm representing them correctly, right? Mm -hmm. I'm representing them as a human being. This is what this is the argument that, that you are presenting me, and I want to make sure that I'm getting your perspective correct, and then they'll acknowledge that, and then trying to come up with the counter argument to what they're saying because that way it shows I'm I'm, I'm paying attention to them. I'm also trying to you know give them as much credit as possible. Right. Uh, behind the, the argument because i mean sure like with, like what you with um something i learned from kurt was that uh, there's for lawyers there's, there's good facts and there's bad facts and obviously you're only going to try to elevate the, the good facts right and try to hide right. the bad, bad facts but um 
are you are you hiding all the best bad facts? And then there's one more thing that um, I, I remember what part a part of um, what got me through the military academy. Part of what got, also got me through U.S. Army Ranger School is this this component of trying to help others. So, for example, at Ranger School, um, you are always you always have peer evaluations at the end of because there's, there's three cycles at Ranger School. There's the, the, the Fort Benning phase, there's the Dahlonega, Georgia mountain phase, and then there's the Eglin Air Force Base, uh, Eglin Air Force Base, uh, Florida phase. And at the end of each cycle, you have to rate your peers, like the best peer or the lowest peer. And so the things you do to overcome not getting peered out of your squad, uh, which is bad, because if you get peered out twice, you can get kicked out of Ranger School altogether. If you have like the lowest peer, peer evals. So you want to always try to be, as helpful as possible to help others, people to, to help them complete the, their own missions, make, make, making sure whoever is in a leadership position, uh, they get their go. Cause otherwise, cause that's what happens at, because Ranger school is by design, a, a leadership school. And mm -hmm. so what happens is um, when you're in a leadership position, when you're, you know, leading this mission out in the field, um, if, if you don't get, if you don't get any goes at all, you're not going to, you know, graduate from Ranger school at all. And, and, the, and if you fall, if you fail out of Ranger school, the likeliness of you being able to go back, like just just plummet significantly so it's it's uh in, you know imperative that you are as helpful as possible so in my case i yeah uh, i'm 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 not sure if you can tell this but like i i mean, i'm a pretty tall guy i'm like six two um but one of the things that i did to always ensure that i was always not peered out was i always like okay um that the heaviest weapon you can possibly carry at ranger school is a 240 uh, bravo is like is a, you know 240 bravo machine gun basically and it comes up with a lot of ammo a lot of gear and so i was like I'm gonna always carry that thing. If 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 anyone's like, hey, who's carrying it? First one to raise my hand, you know. Right. Um, but it's it's but it helps people too. And right. so there's and the, and and that, that plays in what you're saying. Pulling your weight. Yeah, yeah, pulling your weight, but also helping others and trying to be as selfless as possible with what you do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yeah. And it, it's interesting what you you know we were just talking a moment ago about good argument, bad argument. Right. And that's true that as a lawyer, this is one of the things that I think why social media has deconstructed a little bit. Yep. So it, because we've become all about team versus team, as opposed to searching, it, for, yeah. as opposed to searching for like what's right, what's mm -hmm. wrong, what's truth, what's false. Right. And, and, you know, when you're an attorney, okay, fine. You're supposed to be pulling, you're an advocate for your team. That's what you're mm -hmm. supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So I have, you know, I, so I, I have, I can totally understand why someone is going to trump up the good facts and downplay the bad facts or try to distinguish as to why these bad facts are not so bad. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's what your, that's what your job is. That's what you're mm -hmm. supposed to be doing. Yes. It's part of the reason that people hate lawyers is because like, <laughs> come on, like you really, you're going to downplay that bad fact. Well, look, I have to, he's my client. That's what I'm supposed yeah. to do. Yeah. But when you're sitting and having a discussion, a dialogue like this, or a debate with someone, and you're sitting there basically, you know, saying like, wow, I hope he doesn't raise this top. Well, why are you afraid of that part of the thing? You should be basically willing to embrace everything here so you can actually, you know, either the good and the bad of what the, the side that you're on. And that way you can know whether you yourself have found truth. Mm -hmm. what, what's the point? You don't win. <laughs> It's right. like, yeah, you know, your pride might take a, a little hit if you lose it, if you lose the debate, but it have, I mean, it's big freaking deal. Who cares at the end right. of the day, if you're, if you're actually finding truth, I mean, right. imagine the greatness of finding truth and you're going to pass that up just so that this other person might not feel like he beat you. Like, what do you, what, how insecure are you? People so, are just, yeah, people are afraid to rip off the bandaid. I think most, for the most part is what it is. And, and I just think there's people, I don't know. And, and, and to your point, it, it's, it's people I think part of the problem is people just put so much of their ego in their own argument and they're so yeah. like, they're, they're so attached to it. People are more in, concerned about being right versus actually exchanging or sharing knowledge. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah. that, that's the wrong approach is that, Oh, I want to try to be right. It's like, no, 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 let, let, let's do this. Let's tell me what you know and tell me why, why you know what you know. And then let's, let's work. It's like, like what's um, you know, the, the word of that is like, what's your epistemology, right? Like, mm -hmm. how are you, what's your thought pattern on this? And maybe, right. Maybe I have a blind spot in my thought pattern, which is why I want to know about your thought pattern to try right. to like, you know, you know, see eye to eye on this issue. Jordan Peterson actually has an interesting thing where he talks about the, the hierarchy mm -hmm. that we all have like, you know, attached, you know, we all look at ourselves and constantly looking at ourselves in the social hierarchy of yes. things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things when, when he was talking about this, I was sort of thinking like, 
you know, the, the woke movement has become very popular over the last five years or so. Right. Mm -hmm. And and I think part of it, especially if you're young and you're mm -hmm. still, you know, still dealing with a lot of insecurities. When I say young, I mean college age. Yes. Um, so you sort Thank of you for acknowledging that I'm young. <laughs> I'm <kidding. laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what I was saying is so you're sort of trying to find your place in the social hierarchy. Now, traditionally, right. mm -hmm. traditionally, throughout the ages. Mm -hmm. You would earn your spot in that hierarchy. The hierarchy was really very much meritocracy. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, some people might get a boost because of their wealth that they inherited from their parents, whatever. So they're viewed mm -hmm. as being higher because of that. But most of us, you know, stand on our own two feet. It's like people recognize your competence, your ability to, 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 in, to handle this situation, to deal with it properly, to, to get things done, to provide insight, whatever it is. So that's where you're finding, you're trying to work your way towards the higher point in the yes. triangle there. Well, today's youth, they try to find, I think, a back door to it. And that's why, and so what he actually describes Jordan Peterson, he says, that's why when you attack someone else's um, position, so you're not just, and they, they actually feel chemically, they feel worse. He goes to the whole lobster thing when he talks about mm -hmm. this and serotonin and, and, and the, he said, you actually feel chemically depressed. And the reason you feel chemically depressed is because yep. if you, someone shows that they have higher competence than you, suddenly your spot goes down. So mm -hmm. you really are married to the argument. The argument comes part of who you are right now with respect specifically to woke ideology. So if you're a liberal white male, okay? So basically you, you feel like, okay, I'm earning my spot by embracing this, which is so popular with my peers. By embracing this, I'm showing what a good person I am. And I'm concerned about all these other people ahead of myself. And so that makes me feel good about myself, that I'm, rec I'm validating this intersectionality and that intersectionality and women and this minority or that sexuality, whatever it is. And I'm putting them all above, I'm putting them all above myself so that is showing, I'm showing the world what a great person I am. And at the same time, I am better than every one of these people who are not woke. Mm -hmm. And and I'm above them. And that's why, and it starts becoming this class division of like, it's like, that's why if you show, look, this doesn't make sense. This is hypocritical. This doesn't, they don't want to hear it mm -hmm. because you're literally attacking them as a person. You're basically taking them from yep. that structure and saying, you put yourself all the way up here. Really, you're down here because this doesn't make any sense. What you're doing makes no sense. It's not just an attack on an ideology. It is personal. Right. It's, it's something that because they've made personal to themselves. And once they made it personal to themselves, they cannot hear arguments to the contrary because that's, it's, it's, it's crushing. It's right. really genuinely crushing to that. You're crushing their soul. Right. So that's why, that's why they sort of become married to the position. And that's how you get team versus team and my mm -hmm. side winning versus your side winning. Right. And I don't care about integrity. I don't care about transparency of integrity on, on, on a vote. I just want my side to win because it's yeah. either I'm winning or I'm losing. And if right. I'm losing my entire life, my, I start questioning my place here and I genuinely feel depressed. I don't want to deal with that. So yeah. I just want to win by any means possible. And right. that's why, and that's part of the problem. And this is what really the, the elitists want this. They mm -hmm. want us hating each other, but I can right. talk about that for like six hours. And <laughs> so, so, so could I, so could I, I, um, that's, um, that, yeah, that, that I think that one of the biggest problems, I think this is one of the things uh, I shared previously with Kurt, was that basically that um, one of the things, and this isn't meant to be like a knock on religion because I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty devout Catholic myself. That's okay. Um, but basically, uh, thank you for forgiveness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, because I just described myself earlier as being religious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm no, not, no. my point, my, my, that's okay. Is I'm not going to take offense. That's no, 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 I know. I'm, I'm, I can joke too, Joe. You're not the only one who can joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but basically, no, but I appreciate the apology uh, or the, the explanation. But basically, um, I think the worst religion in the world is, um, at least in, in our, my immediate surroundings, is, is the two party political system. Because what it does is it. Pe People get this evangelical perspective on, on the way they look at things, the way they look at the world. And immediately, as soon as you, you go just an inch outside of, you know, what it is that you, um, you step away just a, a little bit from what they're saying or disagree, even in the slightest, they'll immediately just like, you're a pariah, you're out of here, you know, you're not one of us, you know, you know get out of here, get out of my face, go to hell, you know, I have this. And, and what's, what's, what's horrible is that there's, um, I don't like, you know, 
coming from some from someone who's really you know into values and and what have you you know being a catholic and all i i don't like presenting moral arguments necessarily oh this is the this is the right thing to oh because it's the right thing to do right mm-hmm. because you know a lot of people have different ideas on morality on what's moral mm-hmm. what's immoral mm-hmm. and to me it's it's kind of like saying like oh i'm not gonna listen to that person because they have a bias like no that, that's like bias is kind of like wash each other out i, th- I think at the end of the day Right. Where it's like a positive and negative that they don't really do anything and it's just what you have to do is again it just just start with the fundamentals where it's like the epistemology like how how do, how do they get from point a to point b right That's the way i look at all this so right um, do you think you think that the the religion of politics is is more devout than the religion of science you know it, it's really interesting you asked that because i've had a couple of really interesting conversations with some friends and family about this and if you look at like even just recent history of the u.s um the way the, you know, just the fact that we, you know, are basically, you know, bastardized from the, the British monarchy, if you will, you know, because if you look at this, the British monarchy, it's, you know, divine providence, you know, it's the, the king or the queen, they are anointed by God, basically to rule, you know, England, right. And the, so there's a lot of religion kind of baked into that, that, for, that, that government. And so the way to look at that, the way people, the average, you know, British citizen probably, look, I, I'm, I'm making some assumptions here. When I say this, I'm also kind of like going off of some things I've heard other people say, but basically there's this idea that like, oh, well, you know, it's basically given to us by God. And so they have this religious perspective on, on government. And what's really odd to me is I feel like there is this religious element to our own government. And I feel like it it just kind of comes from, I think this is like where you and I kind of like have something probably in common where we don't look to government as necessarily something as like, you know, the end all be all, you know, you have, you know, Orthodox Judaism. I have it's, Catholicism. A, nece- it's a necessary evil. Basically. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so we, 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 you and I can fall back on those like independently. Right. And so with these other people who don't necessarily have that in their lives, or not nearly as devout, you know, they look at that and they're kind of evangelized by, by all that stuff. And it kind of goes back to like, you know, you can look back at like Woodrow Wilson, right. The, the whole social gospel, basically how, you know, we're going to d- democratize the entire world and, and that whole approach. Um, I think that there's, and, and, and for the record, I, I'm not a Woodrow Wilson fan by any means. I really don't like him. I think he's quite possibly the worst president in the history of the U.S. for a myriad of reasons. Um, okay. But basically, um, I, I, that, that's another conversation like that we right. could have. But basically, um, the things that he did to justify what he did is kind of rooted in that same that same idea and and basically what he's done is um he's effectively evangel he i mean you it was probably him who has who had like started evangelizing uh, our government and saying like you know you know it's it's like divine right for us in, in a lot of ways well i don't know we had manifest destiny which has sort of religious yes, that, that, to it. yes that, that, I, yeah, that's true too I, I you know i forgot about that too but i'm just kind of like speaking out loud based upon what i know about in 20th Wilson. century, 20th century, I would, I would agree with you that he was the, the president who, who pretty yeah. much invoked that sort of more than McKinley. I, I'll tell you this. Um, I was, you actually inspired a question that I had in my brain. Mm-hmm. We were talking oh, good. about, <laughs> yeah, you were talking about, I, no, I, you just inspired a question where you basically made a, a, a very accurate point about how religion is baked into the, the British monarchy. My question for you, though, is do you think that it's genuine? Or that it's basically part of a marketing tool. Meaning if I actually claim, because if my the masses are religious, back at a time when the masses are religious, mm-hmm. so I'm going to use religion as a tool to solidify my claim on the throne. Mm-hmm. And the same way, so now that we have the religion of science, we have mm-hmm. Biden coming forward mm-hmm. using the religion of science as a way of trying to rise up to the throne, that right. I'm going to rely on the science. So... And it's something I never thought of that that comparison until we, you and I just, till just right now. And and it's a really interesting thing that I, I don't think it's a matter of the fact that the royals were particularly re- religious. I think that they basically decided to jump between Catholicism or Protestantism, depending on on who was sitting on the throne and how many, whether or not he liked his wife. Yeah. And <laughs> and and I think that the the religion they they probably looked themselves as being godlike. And, mm-hmm. and not having to answer to God, but if they can use God as a marketing tool, you right. know, it solidified their, their hold on the throne. Well, then why, why, why not use it? 
And if you say God chose me and everyone agrees, yeah, God chose you. Well, how the hell will anyone ever step on that? So, so in that sense, I don't know that it's genuine religion or they're just using religion as a marketing tool, much the same way as Woodrow Wilson probably was using religion as a marketing tool because he yeah. knew that a hundred years ago that most Americans were fairly religious Christians. Yeah. So, right. So, but now, uh, come forward a century later, mm -hmm. it's, it's a really interesting, I think there's a really interesting thought. I haven't heard anyone ever express this before and you inspired it. And this, this dialogue inspired it. I think this is great that science being the new religion mm -hmm. now that becomes what the democratic party basically is advocating advocating i am the science fauci i am the science we believe in we're going to follow science it's just it's just following science folks you know it's basically everything is and we just can rename whatever so we call whatever it is we want we call that science you know we'll just change that tomorrow <laughs> everything yeah. is science 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 whether it's proven or not and right. don't question the science all of a sudden science has a whole different meaning very religious meaning of you can't question me is divine right and and it's a very interesting thing that there's a sort of similar religious overtone to it where right. where it's like and now you should you should follow me because i follow science which really means i follow the faith of science Right, right. No, and I think what's really interesting is you, you know, you bring up the word marketing because the way I, I have a lot of mixed feelings about marketing, um, and mostly negative, I should say, to be perfectly honest, and largely because of if it's like if you look at the the history of marketing in the past hundred years, um, it, really the biggest influence on marketing is Edward Bernays, and go go figure, big, big, big surprise. I don't know here. enough. I don't know enough about. About okay. Edward you should. This is. This, this should probably inspire you to do some homework because Edward Bernays was hired by Woodrow Wilson to do the propaganda campaign for uh, World War One, and he's got a lot. And what's really weird is you can say like, oh, I'll, there's a lot of really obvious things about what about, about Edward Bernays that people do not deny. It's like, like regardless of where you sit on the aisle, you know, which are you on the left side of the aisle or the right side of the aisle. The stuff that you'll find with that's related to Edward Bernays is really shocking because he's res responsible for the uh, Banana Republic's situation with the CIA working to overthrow the Guatemalan government. Um, he's re responsible for getting women hooked onto cigarettes. Um, and I think it was the 50s. I, I can't remember when it was specifically, but this is a guy because he referred, them, referred to them as a uh, woman, you know, um, lighting cigarettes. Oh, those are the suffragettes. Those are people, those are the torches of freedom that they're lighting up basically. And so you have all these women who are getting hooked, hooked on cigarettes, you know, and, and, and engaged in a very unhealthy behavior because of people like him. But like, uh, one of the things that, that one of the, my, my favorite sound bites about, um, about Edward Bernays actually comes from Noam Chomsky. And at, at what Noam Chomsky says about him is that Edward Bernays successfully took a passive population prior to world war one and made them bloodthirsty to go overseas to, to, to fight a war. But, um, but it's of no surprise because um, with propaganda, the word propaganda itself, um, it actually, um, before even, you know, Bernays, it was actually, it's kind of funny, you know, we're talking about religion here because um, the Catholic church engaged in a lot of propaganda, but it wasn't the same. And the reason why it wasn't the same, I mean, there's a myriad of reasons why, but a lot of it had to do with the fact that, you know, you know, the, the you know, I, I would say, um, the point when the, the Catholic church was the most prominent was probably like, um, like 1200s, 1300s, whenever, before things slowly started to come down before, like, you know, obviously guys like Martin Luther, you know, the reformation, all this and that started to happen, the great schism slowly, but surely it was kind of like eroding in terms of being the, the main, major influential force in all of Europe. Um, but anyways, uh, unlike today where it's, um, marketing and, and, and public relations are really, it's kind of like they, they elevate only the good facts, you know, like, you know, yeah. to put a lawyer perspective. Yeah. It's very much a lawyer perspective. They, they completely deny the bad facts altogether. And it's, and what I think what's really shocking is the fact that you would, you don't, I think what, what really drives a bananas about a lot of this stuff is that um, you don't, you, you don't hear about mea culpa moments. The closest you get, for example, is, the i know i'm kind of going on here a little bit but like no that's like, fine that's we, fine we, i was actually researching Edward Bernays while you were talking yeah so, so nick nick salmon for example like that whole issue with the all the corporate outlets you know in concert you know calling him a white supremacist saying he went up to that, that, that native american and basically trying to uh instigate a moment with him 
um, that resulted in, in his, his own personal safety for him and his family. And the closest we got was, oh, they, you know, is, is like a small article and, you know, pick, pick your, pick your outlet. But basically the whole idea is that, you know, they, they barely referred to it. It's not like in 1982, here's a good example. Um, 1982 Tylenol had the, the issue with, with the poison, you know, yeah. yeah, poison on, on conser- consumer base. And then, so what did they I actually ended? remember? I actually remember that. Yeah. And so, but what, I mean, you, you, you I mean, I, I wasn't even alive then, but just mm-hmm. from, from research, but and you, you could probably speak this better than I could, but like they had like a massive marketing campaign, you know, after that, trying to say, Hey, this is what happened. This is what we, this is what we learned. This is what we're doing differently. And they, 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 they dumped a whole lot of money and effort to basically, you know, they're basically holding themselves accountable for what had happened. We haven't had a moment like that with the corporate outlets at all. Um, in my, in my lifetime that I can think of. Hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. So you're saying, you're saying that's the last, that's the last example of public accountability. That, that, that's the only example that I On know a corporate of. Level. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to say that's the only example that I know of off, um, just, just from basic research. I mean, there's, there might be others out there, but, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting point that you're making. I wonder if that's because of exposure to litigation that people are refused to do the mea culpa because if I was an attorney for one of these Probably. corporations, I would tell them you're an idiot if you yeah. accept responsibility. Right. Unless, look, there's no way to get around it. But yeah, I mean, I, 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 never, I never really thought of it, but I, I should have that there's a natural marriage here between, mm-hmm. between propaganda of politics and, and the advertising industry. Right, right. So, yeah. So, and you're saying that marriage began with, with Wilson and Bernays. Although when I'm looking at Bernays here, they actually, they, they note, according to Wikipedia, the never wrong Wikipedia, <laughs> um, it says they actually attribute him and they say that his first foray into politics was 1924, not, not with Wilson. So maybe he was behind the scenes. Well, he was, that, that's the thing though. He, he was on the co- committee of public information during oh. World War One. Okay. Yeah. Oh so, yeah. That, that, yeah. Okay. I see that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. And I think that was, that was 1918 for him. I think if I remember correctly, that, that makes sense. Yeah. No, he was actually counsel. He was actually counsel for uh, Coolidge later on. And, yeah. Um, wait, was it Coolidge? I don't know who was it. No, I, saw, I saw it here earlier. Oh no, for Hoover. Yeah. When, when, and later on. Yep. <laughs> there you go. They, that's a guy who needed marketing help in the worst way. Yeah. But so. it's, it's, it's funny you named out Coolidge because Coolidge was the very first president to first ever invite um actors from hollywood to the white house really to kind of you know just to kind of like it, it's and that's a funny little tidbit for the simple um um for the simple reason that you know getting entrenched with the marketing and the, and the uh, political establishment you know it, it goes back really really way back you know you have a strong knowledge of uh, historical you must be, have like a whole interest in presidential in presidents in, you in know to, to be honest like so i was i was actually a history as i mentioned i was a history major at the academy um i was actually a military history guy so mm-hmm. um i figured if i'm gonna learn history at west point might as well learn about the, the military history you know learn, learn learn how you know country borders were shifted so to speak mm-hmm. um to put it to put it very simply um and i actually wrote my thesis on the third crusade um but at any rate, um, yeah, like I, I like history. I don't know, but there's, that's the thing that it, it's like, um, to your point about, you know, being on law tube and, and challenging yourself and learning there's, there is the, the past two years have been so incredibly crazy. I, I would say at a minimum, um, that it's really encouraged me to do even more, um, do some more digging and do some more research on my own, read as many books as possible. My, my wife gives me a hard time because I, I'm more, much, much more interested in, in, in I'll buy these books, but I don't always, you know, get to them as, when I want to necessarily, but, um, because there's a lot of really good books out there. And so I'm trying to consume as much as I can when, when I can. So, um, I read, but yeah. I read myself to sleep my studio is in my bedroom now. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. This, so always by the side of my bed, you'll see a book. So this is what I'm, I'm on right now. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is 1941, the year that, that where is, where is 1941, the year that the war shifted. I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by Nazism. I'm, yeah. I'm, the whole thing to me, from the from the propaganda elements to it, to the psychology, the the battles, the wars, mm-hmm. it's something that I, I mean, I'm I've been going through Netflix and various series that they have. I mean, Adolf is something 
is a figure who's a really fascinating figure to me. I mean, that how he comes to, how he gets to where he is, the relationship mm -hmm. in his inner circle between each of them. To me, um, yeah, World War II is just such, I, I fixate very little on the Holocaust per se, even though you would think as an Orthodox Jew, that would be like a major impetus. Uh, that, no, that depresses me. And that's something that's, it's like, I, I don't really have much interest in, but the actual, the, 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 the rise of Adolf Right. And that, and Nazism, and and the, the various strategies, and what they ex, what their expectations were, and how it is that the masses all went along with it. That's all about human psychology. And mm -hmm. to me, and even though I've I, I never really studied psychology at all, other than the fact that I've been studying it since I'm five years old, but not on a not on a, on a formal education level, but just yeah. purely just racking my brain trying to understand how people think and, and work and why tribal music what makes something classified as tribal music like that sort of thing right so that's something that uh yeah so this the, yeah this has become like a, a passion of mine so i can totally relate to where you're coming from here with respect to you know finding a passion in history i mean both my parents um my father is my mother was a historian so mm -hmm. i sort of was raised in in that type of environment right right yeah i i there's believe it or not there's actually a point where i was actually thinking about maybe becoming a lawyer but i i, I am so like into being creative and 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 and, and making don't, things so to speak there's, there's, there's obviously there's obviously the don't you know it. there's obviously my game like, like that you're aware of crypto cartel but then i'm not sure if you know about this joe but there's i'm also making um a graphic novel series based upon the content from that game as well really yeah you draw i don't draw i write I write, and I have my uh, my friend Manuel Martinez, who um, who's oh. actually put together some some. Uh, he's we're almost done with the first comic here. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want I want to try to have a Kickstarter campaign by March of uh, this year. Awesome! Uh, to, to Good help, luck with that. Yeah, to help That's to help uh, Yeah, to help get those those first initial copies out. It's it's going to be a short comic. I think it's only going to be about twelve pages. Mm -hmm. um, but it's yeah, it's it's coming together. And I think what's really amazing, one of the things I've learned about any type of entrepreneurial effort you know and this is i think this is a really good example the fact that you and i are talking but that there's there's someone out there who's eager to work with you to to make things happen and i think yeah. that's what's really great about this yeah um, i'm always i'm always excited to um if someone if someone ever wants to like have me on and stuff like that if i ever can possibly make it work unless you know especially if there's someone I don't have to worry that they actually are like some psychopath. Which, <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, there, there are there are psychopaths like legal out bites? there. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, but, I can know, say that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I actually think to myself that like it's it's weird to be in a position where someone wants me to come on their channel. That's a very weird phenomenon. A year ago, I literally a year ago, I had 400 subscribers. Nobody knew who the hell I was. Mm -hmm. So it's very weird to be in a place where I feel as. I feel as if I'm able to give that back to someone because Nick gave that to me when I was at 400 subscribers, he had me on and overnight I went to like 1500 and, and yeah. And I basically, and I was like, look, that's, that's a great thing to do, especially if I can introduce people to someone who's interesting, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever, I can help promote them. And someone who's generally a good person and helping the world in, you know, in one way or another, right. So I'm, I'm doing everyone a favor. So that's a, that's a great thing. For so, sure. Yeah. So I, I want I want to pivot our conversation to our fun moment here that I told Do you it. I was showing you with you. Okay, Do so it. if you remember me, me the first time, right? Mm -hmm. The first time yeah. you met me uh, virtually, so to speak. We still haven't met in person, which right. I look I look forward to that. By the way, um, come June, come June. It's, yes, come yes. That, oh, that's right. I, if, oh, I, I don't think the YouTube world knows. Yet, yet, by the I'm, way, no, no. I'm just saying. I expect I'm expecting to meet you in June. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's that's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Close one. Um I no, I was very careful. Yeah. <laughs> very careful. Very, very no, careful. No, no, it's all good. No, 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 it's all good. It's all good. So no, I'm just uh, saying, anyways, I so, expect you're gonna be in New York come June, and I'm looking forward to it. On on planet Earth, exactly. On planet uh, Earth. <laughs> so uh at any rate, okay. So the but the first time the first time we met was on mm -hmm. Legal Bites, you know, my sister's YouTube channel. And right, that's your sister, right? Okay. Yes, yeah. and I came on as Buddy the Elf, mm -hmm. remember? Mm -hmm. And the very one of the very first, what was? The, do you remember what the, the very first thing I did when I first came no. on? No, what you do? I pounded that beer. Okay. Do you remember that? <laughs> you don't remember that? Oh my goodness! We have another person joining us, not a lawyer, but full mm. of 
Christmas spirit. Nice. Joe, you haven't met my brother yet. <laughs> no, is he an elf? Is he is he going to be the, doing the? Yes. <laughs> yes. Andy the elf. What's your favorite color? Andy. <laughs> Are you guys yes. in the are you guys in the same state? Are you in the same location or we're like... in the same state, but I'm on an island. I'm on yeah, I'm on COVID on island. island. Even actually, and you're really on COVID island. <laughs> I am is... literally on COVID island, quarantining <laughs> from oh, really? my beautiful room. Yes. I'm so sorry, yes. brother. That's yeah. terrible. How are you feeling? Andy, Andy uh, ruined Christmas. Yes. I uh <laughs> it's been pretty rough here, you know. With yeah, COVID. I see that. I see that the drunk elf. <laughs> Here's Andy. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Okay, well, all right. Cool, uh, cool, 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 This is like this is like the follow up to Bad Santa. Is we're gonna get Bad Elf. <laughs> <laughs> He's got like elf. this scraggly beard type uh, of thing. He's gonna oh, sit good. on my knee, kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you want for Christmas? Oh, the, the play behavior, but you know. <laughs> Oh my god! But anyways, so I, I I downed that whole beer and, and talking about I was talking about you know having having COVID and stuff like that, but there was only water in the beer to be perfectly clear. Okay. Uh, <laughs> to, to making sure making sure people aren't like oh my god she's drinking beer while we're recovering from COVID. No no no, I, 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 it was water in there. Um, <laughs> yeah, because someone's gonna go crazy. Um, but at any rate, um, so I, what I did I've, I've curated ten snapshots from very popular films of drinking moments nice okay? so nice. what what we're gonna do here is we're gonna see how good you are how how, how, how you know you're able to identify the movie identify the movie yes based upon a, a very limited screenshot uh, from a scene from a movie okay all right i'm not really a great film aficionado but okay. i'm gonna do my i'll do my best let's do okay. it so let's so it. to to your advantage this mm -hmm. th this spans from you know quite a few you know a significant amount of years you know okay um so it's not like all oh, like 2019 2020 or whatever um, right. necessarily it's 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 yeah i i think you know i, I think I, th I think you'll get at least half of these all right let's do it let's okay. do it all I'm right so first one out the gate this one right here just this that yeah, just that. Wow. Roseanne. No. no it's a movie. It's, <laughs> it's a movie. A, this yeah. is a movie. Yeah. Deer Hunter. I almost showed the whole screenshot, but I was like, ah, that might give away too much. Uh, Final guess? I, I, Deer Hunter was my best, was my no, best guess. No, this is from... Raiders of the Lost Ark. Wow, even if you gave me the whole thing, I don't know if I would have gotten that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is, okay. This that's not a person from Raiders of the Lost Ark. What yeah, the it hell is, is that, that? That's that's the drink. That's the uh, the scene where uh, with Karen Allen, where she's having the the drinking contest with the guy, but just in, in Tibet before Indy shows up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is gonna be ridiculous. Okay, next one. Okay, that, one. you. So you were. I'm gonna see that woman. I'm gonna. This is. This you gotta be kidding me. Okay. You were gonna see that woman, and I'll be like, oh, Raiders right there. That, that, that's a dude, by the way. Um, <laughs> that was a dude. <laughs> okay, how about this one? I, I think this one. I tried to make it. I was like, okay, I wasn't sure how 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 knee deep you are into pop culture, or 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 ankle deep, waist deep, whatever. Like, I'm, I'm like toe deep. Yeah, I'm like. Um, it's... Looking at the hands. All right, so that decanter the, the, there. The t-shirt, the, the t-shirt should be something of a giveaway. Oh, okay. Hold on a second. T-shirt. Whack. City. This is this is I'm I'm feeling like bells here. I'm gonna I'm gonna get like one out of ten if I'm like <laughs> it, it was it, when I had when I had Kurt on, we did uh, Western movies, and he he was he did not do very well because I, I did it because he has wears a cowboy hat. But anyway, this is this is I ridiculous. love. I, I'm so glad I'm exposing these blind spots. This is, is this I'm is... actually enjoying this. <laughs> okay, you ready for the answer? Yeah, I okay. got nothing. This is actually Robert Downey Jr. from the Avengers. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. you've seen all right. that one, right? I've, I haven't seen all the Avengers only because I get confused as to which one I've seen. <laughs> okay, I seriously, I, they start blurring together for me. They, they've was... inspired, they, the, 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 the bad thing about the, the MCU is they've inspired corporate consumerism. And if you're not into corporate consumerism, you're not going to, 
Yeah. I seriously between Endgame and this one, yeah. I missed the Hulk, the first Hulk. I also never saw the Spider-Man with the young kid. And I, I did see the whole Endgame. I saw Avengers Endgame at the, okay. at the end there. Okay, this this one right here. Okay, so first of all, I don't really see any much drinking going on here. Okay, but that that the big blue drink is like the big the the, the giveaway. Yeah, I'm. Do you want a hint? Do you want a hint? Yeah, give me a hint. Okay, this came out in the mid nineties. Mid nineties. Mid nineties. It's a comedy. Comedy from the mid nineties. Wayne's World. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I recognize the black shirt. Yeah. I go. recognize the black shirt. Yeah, the black. With a little shirt, help, right? you got it. <laughs> yes. No, I just I, I, I love this because <laughs> at the very end of their little like business meeting at this bar, they go like they, they cheer to Wayne's World, and Garth is holding the the, the, the blue cut. He's like to Wayne's World. It's like they're like cheering. It's like really obscure and like you know. It was actually awkward. Wayne's T-shirt that gave it to me. That, yeah, that and then and the, the genre. Okay, here we go. Oh, you... oh, risky business. No. Dang. Oh wait, wait, wait! Oh no, 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 no! Big Lebowski. Yes, that's the sweater. Yes, yes, great job. Oh yeah. Okay, next one. Okay, this one might be a little bit on the difficult side. <laughs> a little. Yeah. All right, so I did it because because of the, the the drink. Right. So the drink clearly is supposed to make a picture a bee. So it's going to be something having to do with honey or bee or something like that is going to be this drink. Okay, I'll give you a hint. Okay, this film came out in, I'll give you the, the exact year. It came out in 2007. No clue. Okay. This is Casino Royale. That's, I, he names uh, v Vesper, yeah. Yeah, I, I never, I, I don't remember, even, I don't know if I even saw that one. Oh, it's great. It's, it, I, I recommend it. I re I, okay, like, it, it's definitely one of the, one of the Bond films that you. Should I was watch. very old school Bond when they changed Bonds over. I I, it would, I found it very unsettling. I, yeah. I grew up with Rod, you know, I grew up in Roger Moore era. So yeah. it's like, no. yeah, when they changed Bonds, it just was very very unsettling for me, and I was just like, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> okay, all right, next one, next one. All right, Th this one might be a little more difficult. This is a little more on the difficult side. A little more on the difficult side. Yeah. I'll give you a okay. So this one came out, I think it was late 70s. Late 70s. Yes. I think I, I could probably see the actor and, and not know. Um it's comedy? No. A drama from the late 70s? Yeah. Godfather. No, it, well, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a drama. No, not with that fashion. You're not, that's not Godfather fashion. Um, no, I, know it's, I know it's not Godfather. Fa I figure it's some loser. Although, actually, the hands are clasped, so he's calm, and no one would be dressed like that would be calm around, around the mafia. Okay, I'll give you a hint. The, the backdrop for the film is at a hotel. That's way too early for Die Hard. Uh... I think it's his late seventies. I'm I'm pretty sure it's late seventies. Vacation? No. He says not a comedy. No, 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 not a comedy. It's it's okay. I'll give you. I'll give you. Okay, I'm done. I'm done I'll give you. This. I'll give you. I'll give you the actual genre of the of the film. Ready? Mm -hmm. This is it's about horror. Oh, I never watch any horror movies. Oh, <laughs> okay. I've never okay. watched a thing. I watched one. I watched ten minutes of one horror movie once. Yeah, and I was just like. Um, so, yeah, if you're talking back then, I mean, a horror movie in the 70s, horror movies didn't really take off till the 80s. But, um, yeah, I mean, that could be Friday the 13th. No, it's The Shining. Oh, oh, I yeah. should have. Oh, that I should have known. Oh, yeah. that I'm now I'm upset. Now I'm upset. I should have gotten that. Okay. Once you told me a horror, I should I should recognize Jack Nicholson's coat. Yeah. Okay. That like, I should have gotten. Next one. Okay. This one. <laughs> What's with the hand? Is that E.T.? That is E.T. All right. There we go. Another point on nice. the board. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Next one. Go. Okay. This one, non-alcoholic. I think you should be able to get this one. Yeah, that's, that's Forrest Gump. It is Forrest Gump. Yeah, right. that yeah yep. that's Forrest Gump. Okay. All right. Next one. Okay. I'm trying to see. I'm liking this game, by the way. 
Okay. Even though I'm, 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 even though I'm getting buried by it, I'm still liking this game. <laughs> Goonies? No. Although there's a movie in the background. Although, although there, uh, I will. Say, okay, I'll give you. Do you want a hint? There, there is a, there is a movie connection with the Goonies. Okay, I don't remember much about Goonies. Um, it looks as if there's like some sort of bubbling drink that he's he's about to down, like some potion type of thing. Not a potion. That's a beer. That's a beer. That is a beer. Or an ale, I should say. Yeah, I'm not going to get this one. Maybe this if I saw The if Fellowship I saw of the Ring. Oh, wow. Yeah. What's the Goonies connection? That threw me uh, off. Uh, uh, Sam Aston, or Sean Aston, I should say. He was who, plays, who plays Sam. Yeah, he's the main kid in the Goonies. Yes. Yeah. All right. He looks a little bit too much like who to me. He looks Sean Aston looks a little bit too much like that guy. What's his name? Corda something. James Corden. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. He's and I yeah. and I really don't like James Corden. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, yeah. All right. Next one here. Okay, this one I had to I had to actually elim- I, I I just love this shot. Okay. Okay. A little more on the contemporary side. I'm 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 hoping the background will, will be a, a huge giveaway. The obviously and 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 the this is obviously a very clean picture, so that should give you a hint that this is relatively recent. Background. Uh. Yeah, I'm not gonna get this one. I don't. I don't know. Recently. Blade Runner 2049. Oh, I never saw that. Oh, I saw that. okay. I recommend it. I recommend. Really? It. Yes. I never saw the original. Yes. Do I have to watch the original first? No. No, not necessarily. Um, the original is good, though. By the way, I I would recommend both of them. But this is what's the con- what's the concept of Blade Runner? Sell me on Blade Runner. Okay, so Blade Runner basically what it is. Um, it's they basically created. I'm I'm trying to remember specifically the way it goes. Uh, I'm not fully co- connected with Blade Runner lore necessarily, but they create these androids basically, uh, which is kind of funny because especially with the news of Elon Musk and the Tesla bots, right? Okay. That he's making where they're supposed to do dangerous work, right? Um, that was a great game, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, but basically, the whole idea is they had these androids that they created to do off-world stuff, and then what happens is these these androids essentially were more or less having like an uprising and going up against and, ki- and killing human beings. And so the Blade Runners were assigned basically to go out find find them because they look just like human beings, and so they have to do this test, right? Um, and then basically one of the things that, you know, they do is they, they find them, they find them down, they, they kill them more or less. They, they, um, you know, terminate them if you will. And, uh, it's, it's really good because especially in the second film or the, the 2049, because, um, it's like about like individuality and it's kind of like, um, just the way the elites just kind of like throw away bodies and human beings kind of like, you know, uh, carelessly, um, yeah. and just really just forget about regular people i think is the best mm-hmm. way to put it um mm-hmm. that's i kind of like one of the one of the things I, I i took away from from those films um but there, what's really funny about blade runner is there's like five different cuts you could watch of the first film um be, and it's kind of changes the inter- the interpretation of the film at the end because uh do you want to hear a spoiler for, for, no. for blade runner okay, okay no, no not if you tell no, me no. to watch it okay okay good okay so I, I think just watch the the actual uh, the, the 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 feature release. So what was released on the theaters? Watch that mm-hmm. cut and then watch twenty forty nine. And Harrison Ford's in both of them. Uh, well, actually, uh, I think you, no, no. I take that back. Watch the director's cut. Watch the director's cut because um, for, for whatever stupid reason they went with this this. No- I mean, it's kind of like a noir film. But I just mm-hmm. Harrison Ford like narrating is is kind of like it's very belaboring in a lot of ways I'm, I'm, i it's 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 the worst form of harrison ford to be perfectly honest i, I think. really yeah i'm not i'm not a fan of, of him like narrating like a nor it, it, it just wasn't well done um so i recommend the director's cut of okay. blade runner and then watch 2049 2049 is absolutely a beautiful film like visually really? yes um and i i love i love uh denny villeneuve uh, he did Arrival. He also did Dune recently. Um, Arrival was... Did you see Arrival by chance? No. 
No, or, this is like the the whole alternate reality type of or futuristic type of thing. It's like I, I'll fall into them by accident once in a while, but I've mm -hmm. never. I I feel like it's an area I need to explore more than I have. Yeah, Arrival as as okay. As as a parent, as a from one parent talking to another parent, you need to buckle up for for arrival. I'll just say that much. Um, it's it's, but it's it's really it's really good. Amy Adams does a really good job, and and but the, what's really fantastic is about the arrival was justifiably nominated for best picture. Um, the way the story was told was very unconventional, and it, it was incredibly effective because of that. So 20, this is from 2016 arrival. I believe so. Yeah. Really good. All right. I, I strongly recommend that. But anyways, so I would recommend Blade Runner director's cut and then go into 2049. And it's, um, it's really good. It, it, it's really good because, um, and it kind of, and I think one of the themes of 2049 is like, Especially today, like you talk about like what way people, I mean, just we're talking about like tribalism, right? Mm -hmm. Basically where, where we are with, this, with the state of things, like just like we're, we basically dehumanize, you know, half, you know, or I guess one side of the population dehumanizes the other half. 2049 plays perfectly into that, that theme. So I, I actually want to point something out just on, on the whole tribalism thing. I think that tribalism is a necessary part of who we are as people. We need you, you sort of need to have some necessary sort of, or natural. Both. Yeah. Both. I think it's natural and necessary. Meaning, uh, think about this for a second. Okay. A baby is born. It's gonna get accustomed to what it sees. That's a healthy thing to feel mm -hmm. comfortable around things that it's seen as being familiarly comfortable right. and treating him properly mm -hmm. or her properly mm -hmm. from the time that that they were a newborn. Mm -hmm. Right. So for example, you know, I have a two week old grandson. Okay. So this, tiny, thank you. So this, this tiny little, little thing here, the first faces he's seeing are faces that, you know, are going to look similar to mine. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's going to be surrounded by for, you know, the next several years. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a natural thing to feel comfortable, more comfortable around that. Just mm -hmm. forgetting, forgetting about people and whatever races and stuff like that. It's that's part of our natural development is like, oh, you feel more comfortable around people than you do around tigers because people don't look because you're just sort of used to being around that. That's mm -hmm. what you're used to being around. So you have a right. natural instinct towards I don't need to protect myself from that. I can feel safe and comfortable around that as opposed to not feeling safe around mm -hmm. something that looks different right. based on my own personal experiences. That's what tribalism is, only then it gets broken down in, even by race. You don't have to say anything about this other race or that other race. But what I'm saying is if you take a kid who's born in India mm -hmm. and around, around you know, people of, of that melanin level on right. a regular basis, and then you move them to Norway, they're going to feel uncomfortable. That's just a natural thing. And it's the same thing if, if it goes the opposite way. A kid from Norway grows up there and then goes to India. They're going to feel uncomfortable until they get acclimated towards right. people who are, who are just looking different than what they're accustomed to. Right. We all have, and that's, that's a healthy thing as far as the way the human was created, either you can be creationist or evolutionary on an evolutionary basis. It makes sense. Right. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong or unhealthy There's, about that. There's only something wrong with it. If you, if after you reach an age where you can intellectually appreciate that, you say, I'm going to give this person more respect. Mm -hmm. In other words, your initial mm -hmm. reaction being a certain way, that's natural. That's, that, that's normal saying that I'm going to, I'm going to judge someone based on that. And, and, mm -hmm. and that I'm going to treat them differently based on that that's where you get towards racism that's where you have something being bad and unhealthy when you weaponize it right of yeah. course when, when, yeah when when yeah exactly when you when you when you refuse to basically you know and really this is it's, it's essentially where, today's martin luther king day right martin, yep yep right happy, happy birthday to martin luther the king so <laughs> <laughs> you got that reference Mar Mar no I, well, no 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 you I'm don't know familiar. nothing about martin luther the king you never oh. met no martin luther the king is, is yeah. that is, where's, where's that from? I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm in America. Oh, okay. Oh, 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 it's been a while since I've seen that. I remember okay. when I met Martin Luther the King. <laughs> you never met no Martin Luther the King. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, yeah. um, yeah, but his whole message 
was such a phenomenally healthy message. It's a shame that it wasn't embraced back quicker in the back in the 60s, but about the concept of judging people by the content of their character rather mm-hmm. than the color of their skin. Mm-hmm. And that's something that ironically the right has really embraced and the left is today rejecting altogether and yeah. saying, no, we need to judge people specifically by the color of their skin. It's 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 mortifying how that how that message has become so distorted in the interest of promoting, you know, racial equality or whatever. It, it's 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 just it's horrifying right but um but what i'm saying what i'm saying is though tribalism is a natural thing and for people to say you know and, and part, i think that it, the concept of tribalism gets weaponized today by the left where they're like oh a kid as young as six months old is racist you're born you're a born racist because they're they're basically taking tribalism which exists, and by the way, it's not just from white to black; it's black to white also. It works both mm-hmm. ways. Absolutely, you know, black, a little baby, black, a little black baby kid is going to be more comfortable around black faces than around white faces. Mm-hmm. So that's just the way. That's just that's what tribalism is. Right. That's where you. That's where you start from. It's not something anyone tells you you should do. That's just. That's just. That's actual science. That's mm-hmm. na- that's human nature. Right. So that's and for the record. Me- when Joe says being around black faces, he means people who naturally have black skin, not, not yes. white people with black faces. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> someone's <laughs> someone's going to take that clip out of context and be like, "Oh, um, what's your favorite black face?" Nope, Joe. No, neither of us are in favor of black face. Listen to me, listen to me, Bubba. Okay, <laughs> someone wants to get me saying the wrong thing here. They don't need to take me out of context. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but. Um, yes, yeah, so my, my point is that they, that that's that's just human nature. That's mm-hmm. a, that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and, and you know, if, if I even to this day, this is just re, you can't ignore reality just because right. it's an uncomfortable truth. Okay, right. I you know, if Drex and Nick, okay, mm-hmm. walk together, and uh, and somebody says, "Hey, there's a party going on here." Okay, Mm -hmm. and at that party, it happens to be all white people. Drex is going to stick out there. You cannot Mm -hmm. deny that. And if it's all black people, Nick is going to stick out there. Mm -hmm. It's just the way that's just the way that and there's nothing wrong with that as long as they don't treat them differently. You know, as long as it's not like, oh, because you're like because your skin is dark or whatever. That's just reality. And there's no reason to be embarrassed about it. There's no reason. It it doesn't even need a whole discussion. It's just like, hey, judge people based on how they act, not what they look like. Boom. Right, and right. that's the whole thing. It's that, it's that easy. <laughs> it's really that easy. It reminds to, to your point though about like you know like tri- tribalism being you know, um, I guess I, how, how do I how do I put this like just the way people tend to naturally gravitate in that direction is what I mean to say. And I think that what that is is part of the reason why you know here like a, a personal anecdote for me part of the reason why people like going to Disneyland for example is because there's a level of familiarity when they go is yes. it's, it's, it's not going to change over time that significantly. Like they, they in other words, or, or even a better way to put it is when they show up, they know what to expect, right? Mm-hmm. They know what to expect. They know, they know there there's main street, USA, the castles, you know, whichever castle is going to be there or in, in California. There's, there's this. And the characters. Can, yeah. Yep. And the characters. I mean, imagine, yep. imagine this. Okay. Imagine mm-hmm. you took the little mermaid. Okay. Mm-hmm. Imagine right. they had the little mermaid there. Then, and, and the regular girl who did it, the, the, who plays the Little Mermaid, mm-hmm. okay, mm-hmm. In, in Disneyland. Right. She's off that day, and they don't have the right wig, and they end up having a brunette come out and wearing the Little Mermaid costume. It just looks unsettling because yep. you, you grew up with, the, you know, with that, that orange, auburn, whatever color hair of Little Mermaid. And when you see it, you're like, you ain't no Little Mermaid. That's like your first yeah. thought. Yeah, right? exactly. And yeah. if, and if, and and if like instead of the Little off. Mermaid, yeah. instead of the Little Mermaid, right? Yeah. Think about this. They had the Little Merman. You'd be like, <laughs> who the hell are you? Yeah, yeah, I don't feel any familiar. I don't feel any attachment to it. But as soon as you see that Little Mermaid, all of a sudden it's like, oh, you start going, ah, and start, <laughs> you know, and also, you know, and you see, or, or, you know, you see Jasmine and you start, or you start singing Prince Ali. And that, that's what you do because that's all coming from you, youth. And, yep. and what, but that, you know, that, there's nothing that's, that's part of who we are as people. And, and to deny that is just, it's, it's, it's self defeating. It doesn't serve any benefit. And it's, it's really, it's, 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 it's very, it, it's almost like shaming people for the fact that you have any kind of, any kind of history, positive or negative at all. You have mm-hmm. a background, you have, you right. have some, that's basically what it is. It's like, oh, you grew up not with us. You grew up in a different thing. Therefore, we're going to shame you for that, for feeling familiarity with that. What the they hell wanna, does that even mean? They want to shame you for being based. 
that's not even just being based. That's yeah. my point. My yeah. point is, it's not even if you're based. What I'm saying is, we want to shame you for but the I fact was, that yeah. you grew up looking at white characters as a kid. Yeah. But that's the thing, though, is that, like what makes you different actually makes you really cool. And, and uh, is what I'm trying yes. to say. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because because no one no one no one likes everyone that's the same. No one. It's it's kind of like why people hate corporate life because it's the same. It's cubicles. It's it's you know wearing a suit and tie every, every single day. Everyone's wearing a suit and tie. Everyone's Right. You, you you tailor your language so much, you know, people aren't, you know, you, you have to really limit your jokes because otherwise HR is going to come around the corner and, and yell at you, make fun of you. No, not yell at you, but like um, they'll, they'll write you up or, you know, possibly fire you nowadays, depending on what, right. what, what, the, what the comment is. Um, but it's, it's, it's that, that whole that and that and that whole cubicle thing. That's yeah. why McDonald's burgers are like a buck ninety nine, and the mm -hmm. Ouija burger is like ten dollars mm -hmm. because it's unique and it's special and it's different. That exactly. is, you should you should be proud of your individuality. You exactly. should be very you should, and if you're confident in your individuality, mm -hmm. that is something that is just draws people. And then people will buy Luigi burgers over McDonald's regardless exactly. of the price. Yep. Yeah. Well, cool. Hey Joe, uh, we're well past the hour here. Um, Okay. Yeah, I really, I, mean, I really, fun. yeah, no, I, I, I you got to, I, I mean, we all have lives, so I don't want to keep you. No, no, for yeah. sure. No, no, I, I kept going because the conversation was really great. And I, I wouldn't have done it if, if I didn't think the conversation was, was worthwhile. Um, but at any rate, um, well, well, Joe, I really appreciate you, you coming on here and, and, and sharing, sharing your thoughts on me on, on being a law tuber, especially with everything that's going on. There's actually a lot of questions I had unanswered, um, that I wanted to ask. And you want, you, but, but, quick, but, you know what? If you ask me, Five questions. I'll spend less than 30 seconds on each. Yeah. Five do questions it. right now. Okay. Do it. Do it. Well, Five so, and I'll spend less than 30 answering <laughs> each. Well, I don't Go. know. Like I, I feel like, but I feel like, it's a, I feel like it's a conversation for later days is what, is what I'm getting. Oh, uh, now you want to book me. Now I'm trying to get rope <laughs> back in here for another two hours. Just blah, 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 blah. No, but, the, or I could come on your platform. And I could ask some questions. Uh, that, that's or, what or, this is all about. That's yeah. what this was all about. Either. No, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey man, it's all about being selfish, right? Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no. I'm totally messing. I'm totally messing. No, no, I know. I, and, uh, but no, I, I had a good time talking to you. So, Me too. Uh, yeah, Me but, too. but, but in all seriousness, before before we part ways, um, do you have any final thoughts on anything we, we shared before before I ask for your, your social media tags on anything? Yeah, yeah. I was as soon as I walked in, I saw that shirt. I was thinking, I'm a lumberjack, and that's okay. <laughs> cool. Well, um, you, you know that song? No, I don't know that song. I'm not familiar. C can you please pull it up right now? What's it called? I'm a lumberjack. Well, if because I'm gonna play this on YouTube eventually, is it gonna get copyright copyright strike? Totally. Oh yeah. So you're gonna have to mute that part out. Yeah. Right. Um. I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll listen to this afterwards. You really uh, need to hear it because I'm, I'm a lumberjack. You appreciate the comp. You appreciate the compliment I just gave you. I'm a lumberjack. And then let's see here. It's coming up very slowly. What's in it? And I'm okay. That one. That's okay. I'm a, yeah. And I'm yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'll, I'll I'll check this out here. We'll do it offline after after so that yeah, you don't, yeah, for sure, you don't get for sure. demonetized here. No, but but yeah, I, I'm not. We're not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not leaving the Zoom chat until you play it while I'm listening with you. Oh, that's so fine. That's fine. I'm I'm okay. I'm I'm in, I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, because no, hey, you're a lumberjack. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be. You know, my the, the 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 beard is is kind of. I would say it's questionable at best, and me, me being. Um, I'm trying to grow it out as best I can as part of a, a newer look, so to speak. But, um, but no, but, uh, thanks for coming on here. I really appreciate it. I, I think, um, uh, and credit to you and the whole lot community. I think you guys did a, a, a great public service with, um, providing a lot of really great content to the public at large with what's going on, whether it's the Rittenhouse trial or the, the Gisellian Maxwell trial. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think there's a lot, there's a lot that people can learn from that. Um, I've learned a lot from this conversation. Um, this was fun. Yeah, no, I really, I really appreciate you, you coming on here and, we'll uh, do it again. So, yeah, no, I, 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 absolutely. And I'll try, I'll try. I, I, I'm glad I was able to expose some uh, blind spots in, in, in your pop culture. So thank you. Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> there are plenty of blind spots. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my, my pop, my, the blind spots, in my pop culture, please. It's yeah. like, I basically, it's like a big black wall with a little hole as to what I see of pop culture, but <laughs> yeah, no, no, but, but, but what's really great about that is, is I learned more about you, you as a person. Yeah. Probably if I, if I had to guess, you know, you're probably like me because I barely see movies nowadays uh, being a father with, with two kids with well, one on the way, by the way. Um, and then, um, yeah, so that's obviously really hard to go out and see movies. Um, but yeah, so 
And then, so where can people find you, Joe? What's the best way to get in touch with you that they have questions about the law or anything, or, or, or if they want to watch some really good, good content related to uh, so if you anything happening? If you have something specifically you want to ask me, um, you can, on um, Twitter, my, my DMs are open. Uh, I don't always peek in at, at message requests, but I, I try to peek in. And that's at Nearman Joe. That's N-I-E-R-M-A-N. J-O-E, which is my last name before my first name. Mm -hmm. And my channel, as you see up here, is Good Logic, L-A-W-G-I-C. That's on YouTube. I stream nightly, at least Sunday to Thursday, sometimes even Saturday night to, to Thursday, for two hours from 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern. And basically, I talk about politics, I talk about the law, and I talk about humanities, the sort of thing that I was talking about here. So, for example, although the other night I was actually even branching into physics, where I was trying, where I, I had a whole two-hour stream where I said Einstein's an idiot. So. <laughs> you should have. I, I didn't realize this, but Kurt has a really strong technology. Not that strong, but he's. Um, I oh, he I, came he, on. Yeah, he came on. He was so angry at me. Yeah. he actually during the course of that. Yeah. So yeah. So he got he got a link to to come in, and he joined in, and he was trying to explain to me how wrong I was in trying to explain the theory of relativity and what my what i point out is the clear flaws in the theory of relativity and time right. relation and he basically but it, like after he was on for 20 minutes he's like i wish i was in front of you so i could strangle you i want to see your eyes <laughs> popping out of your head because i want to strangle he was so angry with he's, be, me. he's being metaphorical obviously yeah obviously yeah. Yeah. yes yes obviously we all yes. meant he meant it clearly yeah. Yeah. yeah don't worry yeah. don't worry so much about youtube yeah, yeah. You'll be fine. um <laughs> <laughs> well cool well, well, well joe um this was great yeah we just now we say goodbye yeah exactly well th thank you so much for coming on i really appreciate it and i look forward to reconnecting again godspeed